All right, are we ready? <laughs> Makes sense. Perfect. I'm just checking with myself, I think, at this point. <laughs> are you ready, Joe? No, never ready. But that's that's my shtick. Hello and welcome to another episode of Tech Tech Karaoke. This week, we're excited to be joined by DR, the Director of Segment Marketing for the Americas at Equinax. DR, welcome. Introduce yourself to our audience, please. Uh, Joe, Sabrina, thank you very much uh, for having me. As you mentioned, my title is I'm the Director of Segment Marketing for the Americas here at Equinex. Think about it as it was described to me as the glue between marketing and sales. Excellent. And that is an important piece of glue in our world, right? We have to ensure that marketing is enabling and driving sales. And so the two have to be tied at the hip, which requires somebody that can kind of wear both sides of that hat. Absolutely. And we take what, if you think about marketing from the aspect of everything you would need to know about our company, and we take that uh, and leverage a number of insights that we're seeing with our prospects and customers, and then try to help those individuals take that knowledge and turn it into belief uh, for them to uh, work with us globally. Excellent. So you've got that that real fun and hard job of trying to take brilliant technology and make it apply to a current business challenge as the solution for it. Pretty much so. Or as people say, you know, DR, you would do a great job of making everything seem really simple. And I'm like, that's the only way I understand it. <laughs> it it's, it's an art form. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, it's an art form. If, if people can't understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, then they can't purchase it. It's a great point. So Sabrina, welcome. Of course, Sabrina Schaefer Esquire, our esteemed judge for the show. How are you? I am very excited for today. DR is, you're in for a treat. He is so funny and so charismatic. I can't wait to hear the hazing that's about to happen on you, Joe. Um, and yet again, you have not seen the deck. I can assure that right now you have not seen the deck you're about to present. Literally just yesterday, somebody messaged me and said, there's no way. And I'm like, I promise you, he does not. So DR, you can attest as well. And I'm Absolutely. Very today's, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. This yeah. just got sent over. <laughs> and, and for the audience, I just want you to know that this isn't because I'm an honest person. This is because I'm an unprepared person, right? <laughs> I, I, just, I just don't take the time. Well, in all seriousness, a lot of what we do is enablement for engineers and helping them, you know, talk more about solutions and everything. And there's so many little tidbits. In fact, a couple of folks and I were just talking about this yesterday. That there's so many little lessons that are in here um, that it almost looks accidental, Joe. Um, and I hate to give you credit, especially on the front end of this, but that's it for the rest of the day. I promise. I promise. <laughs> that that is that is another great title for my memoirs. Almost accidental. <laughs> Almost accidental. Coming to you in fall of 2024. Yeah. Excellent. So I guess without further ado, if we're all ready, I will attempt to present DR's content as if I know what I'm talking about. So here we are in Tech Tech Karaoke, and we are having the privilege of being presented to by DR from Equinex, but I am going to steal his presentation and present it to you first. What we want to look at when we're, when we're looking at the current model or the current environment of technology is we've got this giant concept of digital transformation where businesses are driving new digital processes to advance the way in which they go to market, generate revenue, secure their mission, whatever it may be. And under this, there are three major components that we're driving as we're digitizing these new processes. The first one, is we need to look at our digital core. And so when we're talking, about, excuse me, when we're talking about core, we're really talking about how we connect all of the disparate things that drive our business from a technology perspective. So this is an interesting way to look at it in our modern world because traditionally our core was something wholly owned, usually put within our brick and mortar walls somewhere on our campuses, our enterprises, or our data centers. In the modern world, that core has been distributed. We're now connecting more and more with technology partners via different technology tools. We're connecting to public clouds. We're connecting to private clouds. We're extending that out to the edge. So where is it? How is it that we draw tight, controlled, secure, and optimal connections for this digital core? In the center, we talk about how do we in integrate and deal with those digital ecosystems. So 
a modern application is touching many, many different components. One example I like to use is, is, is think about a system that is reaching out to something like Google Maps to get map data, and then reaching out to different credit card transaction, transaction systems to bring in financial transaction processing, and then reaching out to internal systems to be able to pull all that together and create an outcome for whatever that customer is doing. We have these large digital ecosystems that need to integrate. And especially within specific segments to plug DR's uh, job here or in specific verticals or industries, we have these ecosystems that need to correlate, collaborate, integrate, and communicate, and we need to be able to bring them together into a tighter, more cohesive fashion. And then finally, we need to be able to push this out to that digital edge where we're moving out of these consolidated locations at central, lo at, at central localities and needing to push that compute power, that connectivity power closer to where that sensor data, that IoT data, that information needs to be processed. So how do we bring these three things together to create the transformation initiatives we need to create? Within this, there are several different components we need to look at. When we look at the digital edge, there are some things that we need to be very, very focused on as we're getting to that digital edge. At the digital edge, we are touching the user whatever that user may be. Now, in some cases, this is a user as we all think of it, the human user interacting with the system. In some cases, this user may be the sensor or, or, or device that's processing that data. We need to be able to create the right experience for that user. And experience comes down to a lot of things, but a lot of it is going to be performance-based. So how do we create the right performance at that edge for that user experience? We need to be able to have intelligence here. And the intelligence or the smart edge is extremely important because this is the area of your IT operation that is going to typically experience the most change. Devices coming online, going offline, disparate devices. All of this change means you need a more intelligent way to address, manage, monitor, and to come to our next point, secure that change. And so that brings us eloquently by accident into securing that edge where we look at how do we secure all of this stuff, especially when we're looking at connections that I don't control, connections from users, connections from devices that I might not have corporate control over, and connections throughout that ecosystem, which again seg segues us to our next conversation, which is around that digital ecosystem. <coughs> Excuse me. When we look at that digital ecosystem, we're looking at things like providing commercial services that rely on multiple separate business entities. So if you look at the idea of maybe selling a car, if I'm a car dealership or a salesperson at a car dealership, I'm working with some internal systems to help educate my customer on the vehicle, get them interested in it, negotiate price. Those systems have to coordinate back with a multitude of other systems. Those systems could include the car manufacturer, that Toyota, Hyundai, Ford, whoever it may be. They may also be different distribution systems, which are getting our service departments, the parts, different financial systems, which are providing my credit options for that vehicle purchase. There's a plethora of systems that exist within that single vertical segment of, of a car dealership. So we need to be able to connect to them and embrace marketplaces that allow the exchange of information, data, and integration of systems in an efficient, effective, and secure fashion then we also need to be able to integrate this back to the idea of SaaS integration. So I love the, the call out here of SaaS integration because it's something that gets often neglected in our conversations about IT delivery. We typically think of SaaS as an all-encompassing application delivering an outcome, and I don't have to worry about that. But those outcomes, maybe CRM data from Salesforce, are also generating their own data. And that data may be interesting to other systems that I have. So how do I create an integration into that and build those SaaS systems into my enterprise IT model? Which brings us down to the digital core <laughs> where we have to tie all these things together and be able to create the optimal environment for this integration. How do I get the latency bandwidth cost requirements that are, that are necessary to deliver that user experience at the front end on this back end where all this integration comes together? So how do I get the ability to connect to dedicated clouds, have that data adjacent to the cloud for non-cloud op operations, and then modernize my network infrastructure overall to be able to embrace and incorporate this into my traditional or legacy enterprise IT delivery model? What we really need to be able to do is 
to create a digital ready environment. And that digital ready environment is going to require a digital core. And so what are we talking about when we talk about a digital core? We're talking about integrating the overall connectivity, localizing traffic, and that localization of traffic creates proximity. Now, why do we care about proximity? Proximity has a direct relation to performance of the application and experience of the user on the back end. Proximity reduces latency and latency increases wait time. So the, low, the shorter my proximity, the closer my proximity, the lower my latency, the better my performance of that application can theoretically become. We're bound, we're bound by physics here. Light has a speed. The further away I am, the slower that data moves. So the closer I come together with these things I need to integrate with, the higher my potential performance will be. I then need to optimize that network. And that optimization falls into a lot of different things. But one of the core aspects here is going to be interconnecting that data with the other data assets that, that rely upon it. Whether I'm ingesting that data or egressing that data to them, to use a couple of technical terms to sound smart for just one second, I need to be able to optimize that connectivity in an intelligent fashion. When I'm looking at optimizing that connectivity in an intelligent fashion, I need to be able to change rapidly. I need to be able to ensure that not only am I getting all that optimization, but that that optimization can change as my business, my environment, my vertical, or my segment changes. I need to move down from there and be able to simplify my cloud strategy. And this is a big one. I'm in the middle of writing a, a brief article right now on the idea of multi-cloud. And we talk about multi-cloud and we push multi-cloud and there are people embracing multi-cloud. Most of us in some way, shape or form are using multi-cloud. I may be all in with cloud provider A, but I'm still using 15 or 20 different SaaS products that incorporate with that in some way. So I'm still using multi-cloud, even though all my infrastructure as a service may be with cloud provider A. So as I'm optimizing for that cloud or simplifying my cloud strategy, my data and connectivity become a major concern. How do I reduce the egress charges that my cloud provider puts on my data to be able to take that data and get it to the other entities that need to rely upon it? So how do I simplify my cloud strategy and ensure that my data isn't the hang up that prevents my business from moving where it needs to go? I also wanna be able to peer directly with partners. Right now, if I am that dealership and I need to connect with my auto manufacturer and my distributors and a sister dealership in another state, I may have to build those private connections myself using any number of private circuits or VPN or the rest. Wouldn't it be more interesting if I could create my primary enterprise connections in a place where they're also creating primary enterprise connections so that I can achieve direct interconnect with them at a lower cost and better performance. And then finally, from that, with that foundation, I can leverage business ecosystems where we're all communicating from that same locality, enhancing our performance, increasing our securability, and then increasing our ability to deliver the outcomes our business delivers to our customers. Being digitally ready also requires that digital ecosystem. And so we've been hinting on this and touching this totally by accident, but let's dig into it a little more. We need to be able to take what these digital leaders are doing and integrate them with the way our business goes to market in our specific verticals or segments. So we need to be able to leverage the hyperscaler power of Google and AWS, OCI and Azure, but we need to be able to do that in a way that allows me to also integrate all of the specific things I need for my industry. So how do I communicate patient data and medical records securely across medical in, in entities from pharmaceutical to healthcare and do so in an expedient and secure fashion. That's digital ecosystem, being able to tie these together in some way on an infrastructure that supports all of them. And the same applies to other major verticals, financial services, content and digital media, payments, commerce, and enterprise communication. So how do we build the ecosystem where we can freely low cost and high performance connections between these different data creating and data ingesting entities that support my industry or segment. We need to be able to integrate these digital ecosystems and overall level this playing field by building marketplaces uh, within that locality. 
So if we begin to utilize a given interchange in a specific locality, utilizing a, a system that brings us together from a connectivity perspective, now we can create direct connections for that data across. But now because we've brought this together, because we have the gravity of bringing together these industries into these ecosystems, we can deliver digital ecosystems or marketplaces that allow us to truly leverage the value of having that integration and connection at the core. And then finally, we need to be able to get that data to the edge. And the edge has its own very specific requirements. When we're talking about the edge, the reason we're talking about processing or, or consolidating data in the edge versus the cloud <coughs> comes back to that concept of latency. I might need that processing to happen faster, which means I need it to be done closer to that edge. <laughs> Think about something like real-time traffic monitoring. If, if I'm doing real-time traffic monitoring and I want to make traffic flow changes in real time, I can't take the sensor data from the highway and send it across the United States to be processed and sent back. <laughs> I need that to happen faster, reduce that round trip time. And since I can't change the speed of light, I, I can change my locality. So how do we look at that at the edge? We need to look at where these edges need to be and further distribute where our data sits so that it's closer and closer to where that processing and transaction needs to happen. So we look at the ability to build these ecosystems in a hyper-localized fashion, spreading closer and closer to the data source or the IoT source. <laughs> and so what we're seeing here is a map of major locations that have condensed processing, compute, and networking capabilities or requirements and cloud connectivity and being able to localize that edge closer and closer to that source, but then utilizing that digital core we talked about to distribute that data across these locations when and where required. So digital business, as we stated, involves three primary components. We need to integrate our digital core, those main processing transaction hubs that extend our enterprise to the cloud and SaaS operators we rely upon. We then need to integrate with the ecosystems across our segments and verticals to be able to exchange data and create a better process flow. <laughs> and then finally, excuse me, extend out to that digital edge where we can get that more localized local processing that then further connects back out to share that data when and where required. This has been Tech Deck Karaoke. Thank you very much. What do you think, DR? Oh no, we've got you on mute. I need the reaction. <laughs> yeah, I said, had, had I not just sent you the deck, there's no chance I would have believed that you just got this. That's, that's incredible. By the way, I don't know if you know about the five steps of being able to take uh, something from someone. It's a uh, uh, Joe said, as Joe said, as he said, as they said, um, as I've heard it said, and then as I've often said. So actually four steps, I take that back, four steps. I'm gonna get this recording and in four, the fourth time I deliver it, it'll be as I've always said, because that was that was great. That was, oh. that was excellent. <laughs> Like talked about this. By the way, I always <laughs> warn the guests, please do not compliment Joe at the end. Oh. Please make sure that there's, you know, pure hazing going on. But here we are, DR. I, thought I, wanted, I, wanted, I, wanted, I wanted I wanted I wanted to pump him up. I wanted him to feel <laughs> encouraged. And I wanted him to know that second place is is not bad. No, it, it's not. It, it is. At least you tried, right? It's it's all about trying. <laughs> At least you tried, Joe. But I, so, you know, I, I'll give it to you. I I think that's why people don't believe me that he really yeah. doesn't see the decks because they're like, there's no way. But right. I'll give you a so, little bit of credit, Joe. That was pretty good. Part of the genesis of this show was when I when I used to mentor, especially sales engineers or technical marketing engineers, one of the things I always told them is, is the slides are a tool for you, not the other way around. So what you want to do is figure out the story you want to tell and how to tie it to the backdrop of the slides. So the idea being like, you don't have to say everything on the slide. You don't have to know everything on the slide. You just have to figure out what is sitting there that will relate to what you want to say in the story and then maintain eye contact with your client or your customer or the audience to ensure that that's resonating and shift is necessary. Otherwise so you get into the, go ahead. No, I was going to say, um, so after hyping you up um, adequately enough, I just want to check of all the decks that you typically get and being the director of segment marketing, 
leading the witness here. Um, how would you say this is as far as the ability to tell a story as well as story flow? So I, I love your deck. And I think the first time I saw you present something, I, I mentioned it to you, but you take a, your deck and your, your, your talk track takes a very business approach. You're, you're taking this high level of what we're doing, this abstract view of how the technology enables it, but you're not digging any further in the weeds in, than you need to for it. And I think that's important. And I think that's one of the reasons your slide deck flows so well is it tells a cohesive story end to end and it tells how that applies to what's going on right now. Um, some of the hardest decks we've had on this show was um, a good friend of mine, James Urquhart, is the CTO of VMware Tanzu. And he brought in a slide deck that was five or six random physics, abstract physics <laughs> concepts. And like, he knew what he was going to talk about, but there's no way you can pull up this slide and like, oh, here's sine waves that applies to, you know. Um, so your your deck complements the way in which you you tell your story, which is exactly what it should do. Outstanding. Well, welcome to a second round of Tech Deck Karaoke. Um, a number of years ago, my father had quadruple bypass surgery. And after the surgery, the doctor came into the room where me and the rest of the family were with my father while he was recovering. And the doctor said, listen, I'm going to need you to do three things. I'm going to need you to exercise more. I'm going to need you to eat healthier. And I'm going to need you to lose weight. Uh, and my father, trying to break the tension, uh, used a little bit of humor and said, that sounds like the same three things you've been telling me for the past 10 years. Um, the doctor, not amused, said, yeah, we're just hoping now you listen. <laughs> um, I didn't realize it at the time, um, but what the doctor was sharing with my father, or should I say, my father's quadruple bypass surgery didn't create new categories of healthy living. What it did do was reveal the three most important. And the reason I share that story is that COVID-19 didn't create new categories of digital transformation. What it did do was reveal the three most important. And what we've seen the three most important to be is this ability to deploy and interconnect digital core or digital hubs, then integrate your digital ecosystems, giving you the ability to interact at the digital edge. And I say this all the time to when I present this, if you can think of an IT project that you're working on that doesn't fit in one of these three categories, I'll add it to my slide. And I've been saying that for three years. Now it's not just these three. When we work with prospects and customers, we take them through this overarching digital transformation journey. Whole lot of talk about digital transformation. Um, it was interesting, pre-COVID, a lot of people started to get hung up on the fact that they thought the term digital transformation was being overused. And then COVID hit, and they said, oh, that's what you meant. You mean truly transforming. And what we saw is a lot of organizations were confusing digital transformation with digital novelty, right? Increased performance and reduced cost. That's digital novelty. Truly changing the way you do business is digital transformation. And it takes not only these steps, but primarily these steps. And so we've broken down each one of these main pillars, core, ecosystem, and edge, into additional areas where we help our prospects and customers digitally transform. And so we talk about this as this overarching strategy. Why we think this is so important? According to Intelligent CIO, almost half 45% of C-suite executives admit they don't know where to start when it comes to their digital transformation strategy. Not that they don't know how to buy things that are digital, but a truly end-to-end -end digital strategy. And this is where we focus because we have seen the leaders in every single industry digitally transform. And so this wasn't what we created. This is what we put together after seeing, again, the leaders in every industry digitally transform. So we've broken it down to nine, which again is can still be a lot, a little bit overwhelming. And a lot of times companies will come to us and say, where do we start? And we say, you should start with where you start with everything, which is the foundation. And we believe that the network is the foundation of digital transformation. I know a lot of people wanna talk about cloud and they wanna talk about edge, but if you think about everything that's on the slide, all of that, is gonna ride upon your network. And yet, 
even though most people would agree that the network's the foundation of digital transformation, according to Forbes, 65% of executives report that their current infrastructure is struggling to support the rapid adoption of digital technologies. That stat tells me one thing, 35% of executives must be asleep in meetings because I have yet to be in a meeting where anyone has said, no, 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 we're good. Two main problems uh, that, that bring that about. The first is just the dramatic increase in traffic. I don't even need to put a bar graph up on the, on the screen here to ask you where you think the data will be in, at the end of 2023, if you think it'll be above or below 2022. Right? No one gets that question wrong. It's going to be greater than that. But the second and the real culprit is how we used to roll out our networks. Right, We had to bring everyone back to our headquarters because that's where all of our critical applications sat. But when we ask companies now, is that where all of your critical applications sit today? No one gets that question wrong either. And what's interesting is what used to be the solution to poor user experience was add more bandwidth. Right, People would just bond T1s together, which... I don't know if people bond T1s together anymore. But what's interesting is what used to be the solution now just makes the problem worse. It makes these networks more rigid. And so that's why this first big step that we see people need to take is that being digitally ready requires a digital core. So again, you know, the legacy architecture used to be bringing everyone back to your headquarters, but now what we're seeing that they need to do is they need to move to more of a distributed hub architecture, right? They need to deploy and interconnect these digital hubs. Um, again, because this is where all of the activity is taking place, but it also sets the foundation for everything else that you're going to do. So, and what are some of the other things that you're going to do? Well, the second step is this, right? This It's this idea of integrating these digital ecosystems. And why is this so important? A uh, number of reasons, right? IDC reports that by 2025, 75% of organizations will leverage digital platforms and or digital ecosystems. Uh, McKenzie states that failing to embrace digital platforms or digital ecosystems is one of the biggest pitfalls in a digital strategy. Why? Because by 2025, they will equate to over two or over $60 trillion of revenue. And who wants to miss out on any of that? The great news is this was our story. This was the Equinix story. Equinix merely started as a place where the networks were coming together to peer traffic. And since they were peering traffic inside of Equinix, this is where the world's leading network service providers built out their core infrastructure. So you think about companies like Verizon or Lumen, AT&T, Orange, Telstra. There is a 95% overlap between their core infrastructure and our data centers. And in the years that followed this peering that became these core infrastructure hubs, industry started realizing the closer they were to this core infrastructure, the more it was going to benefit their business. The first to realize this in the upper right-hand corner were the financial services companies, right? Because they realized the closer they were to this core infrastructure, the lower their latency was going to be. I'm not a subject matter expert on the financial industry, but a lot of people tell me low latency is pretty important. The next was the in the lower left, the content and digital media companies who realized the closer they were to this core infrastructure, sooner they could offload their traffic, performance went through the roof, and their cost went down. A recent success story was Zoom who when COVID-19 hit, went from a million instances a day to 100 million. I know a lot of companies plan for potentially 10 times the growth over a number of years. No one plans for 100 times the growth overnight. But fortunately, they were sitting on top of the core infrastructure of the world's leading network service providers, and all they had to do was turn up more bandwidth. The true turning point for us, though, was when the cloud service providers started deploying inside of Equinix because they realized the closer they were to this core infrastructure, the more of their services they were going to be able to sell, or as they like to say, connections enable consumption, which is why there are more cloud on-ramps inside of Equinix than anywhere else in the world, which is why then the enterprise started deploying inside of Equinix. Because as we mentioned earlier, as soon as they realized that their critical applications weren't sitting in their basement anymore, they started to use this term that everyone has heard. I don't want to be in the data center business anymore. And so they started moving inside of Equinix. 
But then they also realized they could now privately connect with the same companies they were doing business with outside of the walls of Equinix, but they could do it privately inside of the walls of Equinix. And they had the ability to turn up these connections in hours as opposed to days, weeks, or months. And so we started seeing these massive ecosystems like healthcare or like payments and commerce grow inside of Equinix because they realized not only did they have the ability to connect with one another, they also had the ability to address the next 10 to 20 of their IT initiatives because the underlying technology was also deployed inside of Equinix. And this is why we see more interconnection growth inside of Equinix quarter after quarter, year after year, than our next 10 closest competitors combined. Because companies realize that this journey to be digitally ready or to digitally transform involves not only deploying and interconnecting your digital hubs, but also integrating your digital ecosystems. Which brings us to the last point. To be digitally ready, you need to either, uh, it requires data at the edge or your ability to interact at the digital edge. And I know there's a whole lot of talk these days about the digital edge, not a whole lot of agreement on where that digital edge is. I think that's because the digital edge will be the first thing determined by the consumer, not by the provider. Right? The networks determine where the networks were laid, cloud service providers determine where the on-ramps were. It'll be us, the consumer, using this device or the device that I'm staring into that determines where that digital edge is. I had the ability to moderate our customer advisory boards this past year in the Americas, Europe, and Asia PAC. And we would ask some of our biggest customers, where do you think the digital edge is? And not surprising, every single one of them said the digital edge was where their information met their end users. It didn't matter who it was or what they did. So regardless of where that digital edge is, you still have to connect to it. I had mentioned earlier that the network service providers um, built their core infrastructure inside of Equinix. And because of that, the financial industry moved inside of Equinix because how important low latency was to them. You know what other industry low latency is really important in these days? All of them, right? As a matter of fact, 88% of IT decision makers cite low latency is the most important quality of their network. And what's the dominant factor that determines latency? It's the physical distance the packets have to travel, which means this, this map on the screen, ends up being the most efficient and secure path that our prospects and customers' data can take. And as a matter of fact, because the networks have built their core infrastructure out inside of these hubs, their data is gonna pass through these buildings one way or another. It's either gonna go directly through it or indirectly through it. And what we have found is directly through it is a whole lot more efficient and a whole lot more secure. So I started this talk today talking about the three primary components of digital transformation, deploying and interconnecting your digital hubs, integrating your digital ecosystems, and interacting at the digital edge. And this is where we typically invite our prospects and customers to join us in a digital strategy briefing where we lay out for them not only these three main components, but the three components underneath each one of them to determine where they are in this journey and how we can help them get there. So, coming to the end of my deck, I want to thank you for the opportunity today to present on Tech Deck Karaoke. Thank you, DR. I, I love that. And, I, and I've been taking some notes as you've been going. One of the ones that, that, that always strikes me with the, this type of presentation and with kind of what you offer at Equinex is the importance of that locality, right? And you hit on it, that overlap between the internet interconnects, the service provider interconnects, and the industry interconnects all in one location. You literally cannot beat the speed of light. I was, I was just reading an article. There is a theoretical and mathematical model that passes the sniff test for a spaceship that can move faster than the speed of light. But you can't move faster than the speed of light. So what actually happens is the spaceship stays completely in place and warps space time through it, right? <laughs> because you can't move faster than the speed of light. Right. So that that fiber optic cable is traveling light bits down light. We the closer we are to it, the better our or the lower our latency, the better our performance, the better exchange we can get. Yeah. And so that piece alone is extremely important. Yeah. As my as my boss says to that point, he says. 
um, this whole thing that we just discussed, it's not rocket science, but it is physics. Yeah. So I'm three, by the way, I'm three away from stealing that statement too. So I just, <laughs> as my boss says, I've moved away. You step up there. Yeah. Good. I'm working on that. I, I love that. I love that. I, um, that. One of the other things I wanted to point out to our audience is, is there was an interesting thing I watched happen between my presentation and yours. During my presentation, I don't, I'm not the subject matter expert on this and I don't know what the slides are. So the slides become a crutch for me. So I, I was pretty detailed in covering almost every bullet on the slide. But when we watched the expert DR come in, we noticed that DR told a story on every slide and didn't bother hitting every bullet because he's telling you the big picture, letting your eyes absorb the rest. So when you're the expert, don't feel beholden to everything on the slide because your job is to convey the message at a high level. That's one thing we continue to drive home or yeah, attempt to drive home is that don't view them as slides, view them as visuals. Right. And understand that a visual is giving you the opportunity to land the same idea that you're saying in a different part of the brain of your audience. And if you can land those two ideas in separate places, it builds what's called a neural network, which makes things so much more memorable. And so that's the that's the idea that we uh, try to continue to push. Absolutely. And then the, the other thing point I wanted to pull out is, is you, you talked about three big things that we have to do with digital transformation, but you gave us a very tactical starting point, and that's starting with the network. Now, that's interesting to me because I do a lot of work and have worked at Cisco, and Cisco always says the network is the most important thing for digital transformation, but they're the world's largest networking provider. So everyone takes that with a giant grain of salt, right? Sure. If I sell donuts, then I'm going to tell you donuts are the basis of the food pyramid. Right. This right. coming from you Wait, <laughs> Unfortunately, <they're not. laughs> this coming from you has a much bigger impact because that that's not you know that's not the primary core or the basis of your, of your business. So that's really interesting point. Can you expand on it a little bit for us? Sure. I mean, we see that all the time, and a lot of times when organizations come with us that haven't been working with us, it's one of two things, right? Everyone's pushing us to go to the cloud, and we know our network isn't ready to do that, or someone in another organization flipped this giant cloud switch and everything came to a screeching halt. Can you help us? Um, it's also interesting, sometimes we, were, we would get requests to say, my user experience is really poor for some of my end users. And we're like, all of them? Well, not all of them, just some of them. And we're like, would they happen to be the ones furthest away from your headquarters? And they're like, how did you know? So what we're seeing now is every one of our prospects or customers is either on or has been on this network modernization, network transformation, data center consolidation project, because they're realizing we can't bring everyone back to our headquarters anymore. As I mentioned during the talk, I had the ability to present at our customer advisory board meetings. And one of our customers stood up and said, you know, one day I woke up and realized my data center wasn't in Michigan anymore. He said, don't get me wrong, the building's still sitting there. Just the applications and anybody leveraging those applications is nowhere near Michigan. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing companies, whether they're using those words or not, realizing that they need to establish this foundation for everything to work as well as they need it to work. Love that. I love that. And Sabrina, I saw that uh, while DR was speaking, a few of these points resonated well with you. So uh, what were your thoughts there? <laughs> Well, you know, DR, you have a great way of kind of leading the audience to where you're going. So a couple of times I, you probably saw me don't mouth the answer and then you would say the answer right after. Um, and I think that's very important. And anytime we get a chance to talk about physics and neuroscience in the same conversation as tech, my heart grows a little bit, you know, it's, it's good for me. So I, I enjoyed it. This was yeah. really fun. And we get to help face Joe a little bit. So that's it. That's it. But you bring up a very important part right there is that if you can get your audience to come to the conclusion you're getting ready to make about three seconds before you make it, the brain thinks they came up with it. Because in some instances they did, like they came to this conclusion on their own instead of it being some lecture to be like, let me tell you what you need to do. Which, you know, of course, every everybody loves hearing that. And from a neuroscience perspective, to your point, you're, you're, whenever you can chunk information, right, you're just strengthening that neural pathway and then you're moving it along into long-term memory. You can chunk it a little closer to something that's an experience, which helps you yep. memorize even more, you know? So yeah, it was, it was a fun presentation to kind of watch you walk through and, 
Yeah, Joe, you did elaborate a lot more, but you hit a lot of the same yeah. points um, that I think sometimes get overlooked or missed a lot, you know, in this, to your point, big digital transformation world. But and, and, and to that point, and this is a great point, because we work a lot with our global solution architects, who are then the people who take our prospects and customers through this digital strategy briefing. And what we're doing now is providing the customer or the quote unquote audience a consistent story so that when they show up for the strategy briefing, they're like, yes, I remember this. Where are we? And that next step, that strategy briefing, which is what we're trying to get. Now, that information that Joe shared is how we start to go deeper into that. But at least now they have a context to be like, I got it. I understand what this is. Now I know what it is and how it works. Yeah. I was just laughing about the idea of kind of leading your audience to come to their own conclusion. That was the conclusion you were leading them to. I think I learned most of that the very hard way in the Marines. Because in the Marines, you would occasionally get a leader that had really stupid ideas. But you couldn't go to somebody who outranked you and say that. So you had to give them a smarter idea that they then came up with on their own. Right. I mean, that always works. But I mean, aren't we all that way? Sometimes we get so committed and like this, but the, you know, what seven words of a dying organization. We've never done it that way before. But aren't, aren't we the individuals that make up these dying organizations that get so beholden to like, I was successful at doing this before. Right. And we need this idea of this openness and this interaction for innovation to even happen. So, I have I have this idea that that um that that when you get really stuck in your in your business challenge in your digital transformation challenge, go ask a group of kindergartners what to do, because they've got big open minds and non set beliefs. They might come up with something you would never think of. It's a great point, right? It's a great point. Or even be able to present. I my my mom's the litmus test. For me to say, hey, if I present this to you, does any of this make sense? So, love it. I love that. Yeah, present, pretend you're presenting to your grandmother. Would your grandmother understand right. this? Right, any of this, right? Yeah, unless your grandmother is somebody like Grace Hopper, who who basically started all this stuff. Fair, yeah, <laughs> completely fair. Uh, so, Sabrina, I think this brings us to the the ultimate question of of the episode: oh. Who presented it better? This is a toughie. All right. I will say, you know, Joe, I'll give you some credit. You did okay this time. You did all right. You know, eh, you know, on a technical scale. A DR, I mean, listen, if this whole technical leadership thing doesn't work out, you've got a role in TV, radio, you know, whatever you want to do. So, um, but yeah, sorry, Joe, I got to give this one to DR. That for sure. No, um, I definitely, I definitely appreciate that. That was, that was, that was, a, that was a ton of fun. That was a ton of fun. I agree, and I, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. When you, you do such a great job of giving us the important meat in a story format that's both engaging and, and easy to absorb, and I think that's that's the key to conveying information and helping people solve problems. Is you got you got to make it relatable, you got to make it understandable, and you got to make them believe it. Yeah. You have to understand good. their business. I think that's a big part of it too, you know? Right. Yeah. And so, and what we do is if this is 70% uh, of a base deck that tells an overarching story, what my team does and what the our entire segment marketing does globally is work with our sales on some of our biggest accounts, our named accounts or our star accounts, we call them. And then we'll go in and we will personalize the deck so that the deck uses a bunch of their language, their images, and just takes you know some of their projects or initiatives that they have and line it up so that the story that we're telling is their story. Um, and to your point, I mean, people, you know, I think we've talked enough about me, our words no one has ever said. And so when you can engage your audience about them, it's incredible how conversational those meetings become. It actually triggers the same part of the brain. It's a reward system. When people think or are talking about themselves, it triggers the same part of the brain as food and other things that are reinforcing to humans. I'll say it that way. I'm laughing. The other day I received a, uh, a, a spam email message, which we all get inundated with constantly. And, and this one was like, you know, it was it was 100%, this is what we do, this is who we are, this is why we think we, 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 we. And I was feeling a little uh, combative that morning, so I sent them back. I'm like, if you actually want your spam to resonate, talk about the person you're sending it to, because that's what they want to hear about. They don't care about you yet. 
That that's great. Yeah, you should never be the hero of your own story, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, Dr. This has been a pleasure. I absolutely enjoyed it and and learned a lot from your presentation. So thank you very much for joining us. Well, uh, big uh, thanks to to both of you. This was this was absolutely a blast. So thank you. If, uh, if people are looking, oh, sorry, Joe. If people are looking for more information, including on one of those sessions or workshops, where can they find you? Yeah, uh, I'm on LinkedIn or dcarlson at equinix.com. So yeah, please uh, reach out. Uh, love to talk. Um, talk to you more about uh, strategy briefings or just uh, digital transformation in general. Awesome. Much appreciated. And thank you all for watching.